Uh, no, thank you. Um, thank you, Paul. We now move to the uh, discussion and question um, section of this session. We've got uh, just under half an hour uh, for questions and responses from our panel uh, members. If you've got a question that you'd like to, uh, to offer, um, please come up to the uh, microphones. Uh, we've got them, as I indicated before, located in each of the um, stairways here. And if you come up to the, um, uh, to the microphone, you can ask your question from, um, uh, from there. Just while people are thinking, ah, we've got our first question already. Thank you. Hi. My name is Kazim Saeed. I'm with the Pakistan Agricultural Coalition. My question is for Mr. Jamie Penn. Um, earlier in the morning, we heard about how in Australia, a lot of the reforms that could increase productivity have already taken place, and now a more difficult uh, set of reforms are needed. In your projections to 2050, what kind of assumptions for such reforms have you taken for comp competing countries? Thank you. Uh, firstly, let me say that uh, uh, this paper we titled What China Wants is the third paper of a series that we have produced under a project called What Asia Wants. So two years ago, we looked at the global food demand and so on. And we do have an assumption in terms of uh, global agricultural productivity growth. And in that assumption, we incorporate the natural resources constraints and so on. In short, world agricultural uh, productivity was around 3% a year, um, but it has slowed down to 2% a year. So in our modeling, we assume that agricultural productivity growth will continue to slow down in the next four decades or so to about 1% a year. Now, uh, certainly, we also have undertaken uh, sensitivity analysis. That is, if um, there will be another green revolution or something like that that boosts agricultural productivity significantly, then one would imagine the uh, upward pressure on world food prices uh, would be much more less than uh, will otherwise be the case. So uh, prices will be, uh, will be determined by demand and supply. And we do incorporate certain assumptions. But like I said, those are the assumptions which uh, uh, still associate with uncertainties. So the, of course, that uh, uh, parallel to this process, ABA has also undertaken study on infrastructure. And we continue doing research on Australian agricultural productivities. So much uh, will be investigated in those type of works. So I think that sort of is a natural answer to your question. I hope that uh, I answer your question correctly. Um, thank you. Um, we'll, uh, I might just leave a moment for other uh, questioners to come up to the uh, microphone. While they're coming up, um, Matt, I noticed oh, we've got someone. Ah, sorry, I couldn't see you there at number two. Thank you. Uh, Rob Brokenshaw, a Member of Parliament from South Australia. My question is to Paul Morris, and it's to deal with your white paper and the issues around uh, national water initiatives that have been signed off by either COAG or Ministerial Council meetings um, in previous years, the integration of that with NRM, Natural Resource Management, and the grants that flow to state governments from the Commonwealth Government, and the unintended consequences of impacts on growing food production now by virtue of serious restrictions on water opportunities. Um, is your white paper going to be having a look at that issue and issues similar to that, that that do actually impede us from being able to increase food production in a state like South Australia? Yeah, thanks very much for that question. Um, the, the white paper is a uh, pretty broad look at all issues which are affecting the uh, competitiveness of the agricultural sector and, and clearly what's happening with, uh, with water uh, and with the natural resource um, management side of things is a very important element, uh, fundamental to uh, agricultural production and productivity, uh, uh, the land and water that uh, production depend on uh, uh, for, for our farmers to grow things. So, 
um, clearly the policies that are affecting water uh, will be will be uh, very important to the to the process. Um, we're very keen, though, to hear the details of what you're talking about in terms of, you know, what some of the um, problems are that, that you're facing at the moment. Uh, obviously, there's been quite a lot written about water already, and we'll draw on that material. But uh, any additional uh, thoughts you'd like to add to, to that during the process, we'd appreciate. Mm -hmm. And also, we know that um, the solutions have proven quite difficult uh, on water over time. So um, to the extent that there's new ideas or, or new thoughts, we're happy to sort of feed those into the process for, for government consideration as well. Thanks. OK, what we're waiting... Oh. Peter. Thank you. Uh, Peter Corrish, Corrish Farms, uh, Gundawindi. Question probably for both Paul and, and Matt. Uh, we've heard a lot this morning about the, the opportunities that, that exist in, in Asia and will exist into the future, which is certainly quite encouraging. We've also heard quite a deal about uh, production costs and competitiveness of, uh, of Australian agriculture, and I agree with the, the comments that have been made that it is an increasing issue for us. Um, how we uh, ensure that we have access to those developing market opportunities in Asia is a, is a huge question for us. Mm. And, uh, and there's certainly some attributes of Australian agriculture that need to be better promoted uh, in regard to ensuring that we have access to those markets going forward. Matt, you made a, a comment that the R&D corporations are doing some work in, in this area and, and industry generally is doing work in this, this area. Is it an issue for industry or is it an issue for both government and industry to work collaboratively to better promote the advantages of Australian agricultural production going forward? OK, Peter, you've um, directed that to both Matt and Paul, so maybe the best thing is to go straight to Matt and then uh, have, uh, let Paul have a crack at it as well. Matt. OK, yeah, thanks, Peter. And I think the answer is both. I think, uh, as you'd be well aware, Individual commodities have invested at times significantly in their own branding, and I, I can point to Aussie beef in Japan as just one example of that over time. Uh, I think the missing ingredient has been the, the umbrella branding for Australia, and so we can look at New Zealand with the you know 100% pure, etc. Uh, and I, I just think that that that's that's part of the missing ingredient. So uh, whilst we can all stand here, and I'm sure many people will say we've got a fantastic clean green image. Well, you know, from my perspective, uh, you know, I'd like to really, really test that. And uh, I think that can, I'm sure it's there, but I think it can be augmented, it can be improved with some dedicated resourcing going towards a brand Australia type, type approach. So I think that's the, well, one of the missing ingredients. Um, it can provide that platform. You know, individual commodities don't have to lose their own branding presence, but it can be linked to that overall branding. And I, I think uh, that will be important. It's not, it's not the be-all and end-all, Peter, but I think it'll be an important ingredient uh, if we can continue to push into these markets, gain that access uh, through the free trade uh, agreements, uh, and then with what follows, which will be individual commodities and exporters uh, pushing into those markets. Paul? Yeah, thanks, Peter. And uh, I guess firstly to acknowledge uh, the review that you did in 2005 as well uh, is also an important input into the process that we're, we're doing now. Obviously, a lot of the problems and issues that you looked at uh, back then were uh, also very relevant to what we're doing now. In terms of the trade front, um, uh, certainly it's an issue for both industry and for, and for government. Um, the primary government role is clearly in terms of ensuring that industry has got the opportunity to get into markets in the first place. And um, we've seen over time that I think a lot of the traditional tariff and quota barriers have, have lessened. There's still quite a few of them around. Uh, and, you know, we could do a bit more work in terms of uh, getting those down as much as possible through three free trade agreements and, and maybe through the WTO if we can ever get a, a, a landing on that. Um, but I think more importantly, and particularly for, for Paul and his department, is uh, the technical market access barriers in, in those overseas markets. And increasingly we're finding as um, a lot of those developing countries become more developed, they're becoming uh, much more sophisticated with their sanitary and phytosanitary barriers in those markets and, uh, and even increasing them over time. And so there's 
a lot of work to do at the uh, bilateral country to country sort of level to try and work on those uh, technical barriers and, and make sure we've got um, uh, a set of quarantine conditions in place in those markets that enable our, our producers to get into the, uh, into the markets. Uh, for industry side, at the end of the day, it is up to industry to, uh, you know, if the market is open, then to take advantage of, of those uh, market opportunities. Uh, it uh, it can be can be difficult, obviously, to get into into markets, and uh, the, you know, government can help to some degree through Austrade and so forth. But ultimately, industry you know needs to do their homework in those markets. Um, uh, you know, get the market information that they need to understand what that market wants um, and, uh, and what it needs. Interestingly, some of the models that we're seeing, um, I sort of mentioned a few farm models uh, in my speech, but um, we're also, uh, we met a, an interesting company in, uh, in uh, Tasmania when we were down there um, who uh, actually grow a, a huge amount of vegetables, um, but uh, when I asked them, you know, what the nature of their uh, operation was, they didn't say they were farmers, they said they were marketers. Uh, and they're uh, exporting into the mainland of Australia as well as selling domestically in Tasmania, um, but also exporting to Japan, Korea and another number of other uh, markets uh, through Asia. Uh, but because they think of themselves as a marketing company rather than a farm, a farming venture, uh, they actually not only supply product from Tasmania, but they also link in with growers in um, Queensland and WA so that they can supply a continuous supply of carrots and onions into the uh, into the markets they're supplying in Asia. So they're they're looking much more to what their buyers want, and what their buyers want is a continuous supply of uh, of a particular quality of, of uh, vegetables to meet their demands and clearly in most parts of Australia you can't continuously supply um, a level of, uh, of that product over, over the full year and so by linking in with uh, they say about 120 growers throughout Tasmania and the rest of Australia they can actually maintain that continuous supply and operate as a, as a marketing company rather than just as a, as a farm. Uh, now I'm not saying that all farmers need to do that but um, the sort of opportunities to link into companies like that where they're actually looking to the market and looking to uh, the supply chains and understand those markets and, uh, and so sort of are better able to sort of meet the demands of customers and potentially grow in the future. So there's some good examples out there of industry doing, doing the right thing too. Yeah. No, thank you, Paul. Um, next question from number five. Thanks. Uh, Ross Kingwell from the Australian Export Grains Innovation Centre at the University of Western Australia. I guess a question to Matt and Paul. We've heard from Jamie and others about quite bullish outlook for opportunities in Asia. I wouldn't mind you commenting on our capacity to actually deliver on those opportunities. If you look at our capacity with respect to funding from state governments withdrawing from the agriculture portfolios, limited expenditure capability at the federal government, uh, an urbanised voting community that is increasingly probably estranged from agriculture. So given those sort of impediments to capturing those growth, do you mm. see a buoyant outlook or not? Are you talking about grain specifically or just generally? I, I think generally. Yeah, okay. Uh, look, I think, as I said before, firstly, well, there's two parts to it. It's our ability to supply, so to produce here, and I talked about uh, the need for uh, continuing lift, the lift in productivity at this end. I know it's one part of the equation, but it, but it is an important one. Uh, we've talked about, so what, what, what factors are at play there? Well, there's a number. One of those is... Um, obviously the access to the natural resource and, and that's that abil the ability for that to grow. I think in Australia we all agree uh, it's limited. I'm not saying there's, there's no more opportunity. In fact, uh, when we talk about the Northern Australian white paper pool, that's uh, one of the areas we certainly need to look at. Uh, productivity itself, and we, we've seen some, um, some data on that today, uh, depending on which commodity you're talking about. There's still certainly room for improvement there and, and the trend is still upward. Uh, but, you know, it, it, we're going to get to a point where uh, some of these trends will start to bump into each other. So, 
Uh, for instance, uh, in grains, if you're talking grains, there's, there's significant uh, opportunity perhaps in, in the biotechnology area. And then uh, I assume we've got some retailers here today. If we, we, we talk to them about changing consumer tastes, um, you know, how do those two sort of match and are we able to continue to go down that path? I mean, from a farmer's perspective, uh, by and large, they'll be saying, I hope so. Um, uh, so there's, there's that in What's our ability to supply? We talked about the, the other factors that play domestically uh, that I guess are, are either limiting factors or they mean that, uh, you know, how we placed against our international competitiveness. So we talked about wage costs and flexibility as, as part of that. There is significant opportunity. Uh, to some degree, we're limited. We have a limitation in Australia as to how far we can go, but we can certainly grow uh, well and truly beyond what we're doing now. When it comes to competing in those international marketplaces, I guess uh, what's not or well, less well known uh, is moves from other countries, be they developed and or developing nations, who have access uh, to more natural resources, who have those lower uh, wage cost structures we talked about before, and are quite bullish in the market in terms of the way they're marketing their product. So that's what I said before along the lines of it won't just fall in, in our laps. Uh, we need a concerted effort uh, in order to, to eke out those opportunities um, uh, as they start to grow in those countries. So there's two sides to the equation. Um, it, you know, the outlook uh, is certainly there. There's some buoyancy there, I believe. Uh, but we do need to overcome some of the issues we're facing domestically and be able to compete effectively in those international marketplaces. Paul. And Paul? Um, thanks. Look, uh, I think uh, there's enormous physical potential in Australia to dramatically increase production. Um, uh, it might seem like there's a lot of constraints, uh, but there's um, lots of opportunities to uh, take advantage of new technology and to, um, uh, and to increase intensification of agriculture in Australia to increase production. The real issue, though, I think, is whether it's worthwhile doing it or not, and, uh, and that comes to the economics of it, and, uh, and whether you're going to get the um, returns that actually justify either the increased intensification or, uh, or the expansion into new areas or the investment in infrastructure and, and so forth. Um, ultimately, if you want to expand production, there are three ways you can do it. Uh, one is you increase the use of inputs, which is effectively the intensification. The second way is to try and improve your productivity, so for the same level of inputs or less inputs, you produce more. Uh, and then thirdly, by expanding your production into new areas. Um, intensification of production is only justified if you have a sort of a, a, a growing market and, uh, and prices which justify that uh, level of additional expenditure on the inputs and a yield coming from uh, that, that intensification that justifies that, that investment. Productivity, um, I think the issue there is really whether we are willing to invest uh, more into R&D and whether we can actually get that R&D out into the paddock. Uh, we're hearing um, quite a lot from our consultations around um, problems with extension and, um, you know, we all know the story about state governments um, and others sort of backing away from extension over time and the private sector perhaps either not having picked up the ball on that or, uh, or farmers not willing to pay for the uh, services that they got from state governments for free in the past. But certainly there's a need to look at that whole extension area and whether we can do a better job of getting the R&D out in the, um, uh, in the paddock. Uh, and then the third way, as I mentioned, is, is really expanding area. And um, while I think the scope to do that within the existing farming areas in Australia is relatively uh, limited in the traditional sort of wheat-sheep zone, certainly uh, northern Australia does present a lot of, a lot of opportunities. Um, there, uh, you know, CSIRO's done a lot of work on that. They've identified that it's not a case of, you know, expanding agriculture across the whole of the north. It's actually a more of a targeted approach to um, particular areas where there is prospects of controlling water and, uh, and getting the, the water into, into irrigated areas that uh, will enable us to expand production in, in that area. And as, um, <clears throat> as Matt said, that's sort of partly uh, what the Northern Australian White Paper, which is sort of a a sister um, white paper which is being also prepared in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet will be looking at and of course um, 
we'll also look at that as part of our agricultural white paper as well. Um, but again, the opportunities to expand the north, while certainly there in terms of a physical sense, uh, if we're willing to put the infrastructure investment in that and, and industry is willing to expand in that area, at, at the end of the day, it's going to be dependent on, um, on the economics of whether it's worthwhile to uh, have a, a, a big expansion of agriculture in that region. And it's sort of been um, a recent publication by CSIRO, which actually is a very interesting one because it looks at all the successes and failures of past agricultural schemes in northern Australia uh, and well worth looking at. Um, and what they've found is, despite my, I guess, uh, uh, previous ideas as to what the constraints were, which were more around environment and pests and things like that, um, they found that the biggest constraint was really around the economics and business practices that were actually being used in those schemes. And, um, and so it's, it was more often than not that uh, they didn't have the business um, uh, structures right or the, um, or the economics weren't there. So I think that's going to be a key to expansion of production in Australia. There's got to be the returns there for, um, for industry to make it worthwhile. Okay. No, thank you, Paul. We've got another uh, question. We've probably got time for one or two more questions. Yes, up at number three. So, um, Hunter Clavin, CNH Capital Australia. Um, my question's to Matt and also to Paul. Um, we've seen that um, we export 60% of our produce and that we've got enough um, production to be able to feed 60 million people in Australia. With um, China's outlook to 2050, what is Australia's outlook um, towards 2050 as well? <laughs> Can we just start? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, maybe Jamie might be better at answering that. Uh, he's the uh, he's the ABARES uh, expert on uh, on the outlook. Um, I, I think uh, it depends what you mean by that. I mean, I, I think uh, certainly the uh, the population trends are forecasting that the Australian population is going to grow in the future, and um, and that's going to present a uh, a domestic market for our producers also to be to be looking at. I guess uh, it doesn't quite answer your question, but one of the uh, one of the um, comments that was made to us um, while we were in down, down in Tasmania was that a lot of Tasmanian producers are actually finding that it's far more valuable to focus on the uh, domestic market or the mainland market in Australia for their produce, even for things like salmon and, uh, and, and, uh, and some of the other um, food products, uh, fruit and veggies and so forth, than to actually look to overseas markets. So I think um, certainly for some producers, you know, the domestic market is prospective. Um, you know, we're a, 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 a strong um, developed nation with, um, uh, with good growth for a developed country uh, and, uh, and also reasonably uh, uh, strong population growth, although an ageing one uh, over time. Um, and that sort of presents, uh, you know, a good domestic market as well for, uh, for our producers. But I might hand over to Jamie and Matt to see whether they want to add anything to, to that. You look far better from me to get into, uh, into these sort of projections, but I guess uh, what we've seen is some pundits uh, talking about anywhere between uh, a 50% growth in, uh, in production uh, over that period to, to a doubling of production uh, over that period. So I guess it depends on who you believe. But even if you take those figures, what are we talking about? Uh, somewhere between... They're feeding uh, 90 and, and 120 million people. Uh, over that time, I think the Australian population is projected to grow to about 38 million or thereabouts. Uh, so whilst there are further opportunities domestically, I think if you look at the projections that Jamie was talking about in Asia, in terms of pure population, uh, you know, the opportunity has got to be greater uh, in those overseas markets. But again, they're only greater if we can realise them. That is, securing those markets, uh, getting the sort of value return uh, that, that is required and necessary to make it worthwhile from not just a farmer's perspective, from processor, exporter and everyone else who's involved. Uh, so, look, I think if, if those projections are sitting somewhere in that, in that range, I, I think there's, there is significant opportunity, uh, but it's up to, to us and us as industry and, and it is in, with government as well as to how we grasp that and also getting the policy settings right domestically uh, as much as we can to allow this industry to realise that opportunity. So uh, I think we're starting with some very positive steps, but we, we need to keep uh, going at that. 
Did you want to comment, Jamie? Yeah, uh, just uh, <coughs> very quickly, uh, given Paul Moore's uh, uh, name, me, as the, the uh, forecaster, I think say it's fair to say if we believe when we move into international markets and there will be competitions, certainly some principle will apply domestically when agriculture is competing with other industries for natural resources, and there will also be import competitions for a certain agricultural industry. So I think the principle of competition will prevail uh, in uh, the foreseeable future, and certainly the future of uh, or the outlook for domestic agriculture industry will depend on the ability to compete in a very competitive environment. Okay, I think we've got time for just one more question. So for our final question, um, Brad, number to, five. To Paul, um, I hope in this work that you uh, go back and uh, brush off the green paper in agriculture produced by the then new Whitlam government. It was an excellent document and one of the few readable government uh, productions that I've ever seen. Uh, the other thing, I'm very glad to see that ABES has discovered share farming as a system that exists. Uh, success in agriculture uh, relies very much on patient capital with a fair bit of hurt money in by the uh, people who run it. Brains helps. Uh, if you're going to look at systems that survive in the management of agricultural land, uh, it would be very interesting if you looked in some depth about which ones have survived and produced good results. You must remember that the Jews were share farming for the Egyptians 3,000 years ago, and due to poor labour relations, they all left. <laughs> okay, I'm not sure who's going to take that on. Paul, you'll take that on first. Yeah, I think uh, Graham pointed it to me. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, Graham, I wasn't, around, I wasn't uh, working in the area in uh, 1970 or in, in 3000 BC, but I'm um, <laughs> glad to hear you were, so uh, I'll take your, uh, your advice on that. Um, look, uh, I think... Um, I think the reason I mentioned share farming was really to, uh, to indicate that there are a number of models out there that we need to be looking at and, uh, and certainly, as I said, that it's sort of something that's been around a long time and um, there's quite a lot of economic literature on it which suggests that it's not necessarily the best model in the world in terms of um, economics behind it. And the, the, problem, the problem historically with share farming has been that um, the incentives for the share farmer aren't necessarily the same as the incentives for the owner of the land. Um, the owner of the land is often looking to the uh, long-term uh, benefit from um, uh, capital growth and uh, productivity of that land, whereas a sh share farmer is often um, more interested in mining the land for um, uh, to get a short-term profit and, and get his returns. And so. Um, there can be a bit of a conflict in terms of the incentives that are faced by individuals involved in, in those sort of uh, models. And so uh, in going forward and sort of suggesting that, you know, we need to look at new models, we also need to recognise the lessons from the past in terms of why some of those models, which were quite popular in the 70s and, um, and other periods, perhaps 3,000 years ago, I don't know, um, are actually um, sort of faded away in terms of their, um, their popularity. And, uh, in talking with sort of people around some of these uh, these alternate models, um, there are sort of different ways of approaching them that actually perhaps um, aren't necessarily a share farming type model, but actually do result in um, the land continuing to be owned by a family farmer, but um, perhaps being farmed by uh, a number of other people uh, through either setting up joint venture companies or through um, leasing arrangements and things like that. And uh, one particular example we, um, uh, we came across was where um, a, a farmer was getting a, a little older and um, he uh, wasn't sort of wanting to farm anymore, but he wanted to retain the farm in the family. And uh, he actually um, uh, set up a joint venture company with two brothers who didn't have the capital to enter into farming but wanted to go into farming. And so by setting up this joint venture arrangement where one of the, um, as it happens, uh, brother, um, uh, ended up doing the farming on the basis of a commercial uh, lease arrangement or commercial contract arrangement he was paid uh, on the basis of. 
the, the person who owned the land, the farmer, was paid a commercial rate for, for the leasing of the land. And then the three of them shared the costs um, three ways, and, uh, and then they shared the profit three ways. And so it was sort of a model that spread the risk uh, a little bit away from um, the individual landowner to, to other people. It provided sort of new input and new capital into, into the farm, enabled them to uh, operate a bigger land area because they've expanded and leased other land now and taken on other land. And it also enabled new entrants to come into far uh, farming, young farmers who wouldn't otherwise have been able to enter farming. So I'm not saying that you know, one particular model is right for, for, uh, for everyone, but um, there are a sort of a number of models out there, I think, that are well worth uh, looking at, Graham, both um, uh, you know, for, for the future and, uh, and looking at whether there's sort of opportunities to perhaps um, bring in more business-type um, arrangements into... Um, uh, into the traditional model of farming, but still retaining sort of the family ownership structure, which I think is so important to the culture and traditions in, in farming. Mm. Okay, thank you, Paul. I think that now takes us a little over time, so it's probably the right time for us to conclude this session. Um, at the beginning, I said that uh, with such a broad topic, I was fearful that our, um, our speakers this morning would be under real pressure and you might have been able to see sweat from their brows. I was sitting very close. I saw no sweat whatsoever um, from any of our three, uh, three speakers. I think you uh, handled a big topic in a very, very informative way. And uh, I'd like everyone here to join me in thanking our panel panellists for their presentation this morning and this afternoon. It's now, of course, on to lunch. Uh, a number of panel sessions uh, this afternoon, uh, but um, uh, I'm sure everyone's looking forward to getting out and having a bite of uh, lunch. Thank you.